The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic and Clearview Cyclones. And we're going to start out with our giveaway winner announcement. And also, this, this month's giveaway is fantastic. Yes. We're outdoing ourselves every month. Are we? Yes, we are. I'm trying hard. We're trying. It's July now. And in June, we gave away a ArborTech mini grinder and a Fuji Spray mini mite, was it? Uh, yeah, the mini mite. HVLP system. HVLP turbine system. Uh, and the lucky winners are, let me. Noah Mudge. Mudge. He won the ArborTech Mini Grinder. And Tanya Roberts, uh, she won the HVLP system. If you go to thewoodwhisperer.com slash giveaway, has all the information, has the widget. We also have it on the Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash thewoodwhisperer. Basically, we're just working with different companies, and they're giving us tools to give away to you guys. Um, and Why not, right? Yeah. <laughs> if we <And laughs> massage these relationships over the years and I could squeeze some free tools out for you guys, why wouldn't we it's do that? It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and July is no exception. We have an awesome giveaway going on right now. So cool. For a Powermatic floor standing drill press. It's awesome. I'm, I'm actually kind of jealous. I have the old one and I'm lucky to have that. But holy smokes. This gets great reviews on Amazon. I was reading some of the reviews. It really does. If you're listening to this and you're not in either the United States or Canada, I'm sorry. It's not personal. Giveaway rules and regulations in other countries get really complicated. And because of the value of the tool, um, it just gets really sticky quick. Yeah. International giveaway laws, you have to sort of conform to the laws in every region yeah. that you have the giveaway. So think about that globally. It's impossible for people like us, small companies it's like us. The two of us. Yeah, to figure all it, it, it just the liability is an issue, yeah. so we apologize. But that doesn't mean we love you. Enjoy your bangers and mash as we do our show, right? I guess. I have all kinds of oh, cool stuff. I'm so excited. It's awesome. <laughs> all right. right. Get out of here, sister. Bye. I got one of the coolest things I've ever received, because it's actually not even for me, it's for my son. Dennis DeMichael, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Thank you, Dennis, for sending this. Uh, Dennis is a engineer that works with the Blue Angels and asked if uh, we would like a poster for Mateo, and they actually, in a really nice script, wrote his name on the top, sent us a couple of posters signed by the Blue Angels dudes, right? How cool is that? I know as a kid I would have loved to have something like this, so I figured, um, more appropriate than hanging it in my shop would be to put it up in my son's bedroom. So uh, he doesn't quite get it just yet, but he will soon. <laughs> so thank you so much for that, Dennis. I really appreciate it. Okay, next up, very quick announcement. We've got a sale coming up at the Wood Whisperer store where you can get, I believe, 20% off Tuesday, July 8th. It's our Christmas in July sale that my mom gets all excited about and likes to do. Uh, so uh, give my mom something to do. Go buy a shirt or something. I'm wearing a Wood Whisperer shirt here today. Uh, we believe in having very high quality shirts. We don't sell crappy shirts. We get them made ourselves. We have a family member that does screen printing. So it's all done by us and really good quality stuff. So Wood Whisperer Guild shirts, regular t-shirts. Uh, my hybrid woodworking book is gonna be on sale. DVDs, all that stuff. Corey. Let's take a look at his bed. It is a purple heart and walnut bed. He says it took about three months of nights and weekends. I think he has a day job that's in a shop and he was able to use the shop in the evenings and on the weekends to finish this up. Uh, it gave us a nice story. You could read about it on the Wood Whisperer, but uh, finished it up with some Minwax wipe on poly. Look at that footboard. Some beautiful book matched panels. Had to do some veneer work to get that done. The moldings. I mean, this is, uh, this is nice stuff. This is really nice stuff. Should mention that if you want to submit your own project, you can do that. Uh, Thewoodwhisperer.com slash contact slash submit dash your dash project. Because we believe in very simple URLs at The Wood Whisperer. All right, so let's go into our kickback segment. But y'all. We had a conversation on Facebook at one point and the question of wood movement came up and uh, Patrick said is uh, just kind of, I don't remember exactly what he said, I couldn't find the quote, but he wanted to know if the concern over wood movement is a bit overblown. And I think depending on where you live, sometimes wood movement is more or potentially less of an issue. So from someone's perspective, it might not be such a big deal. Uh, but the truth is, yes, you do have to worry about wood movement, always. Uh, there are some basic rules that you need to follow when it comes to wood movement. You really just don't want to restrict the movement across the board. Now we're talking, generally speaking, flat sawn material, which is what most of us will get access to. 
uh, they move across the grain. You can see I've got these arrows showing you where most of the movement is going to take place. So there are things that you can do. You can glue these two boards like this, because now everything kind of just moves in unison as it expands and contracts over the course of the seasons. That's okay. What is not okay is when you put these perpendicular. All right, and if you restrict the movement like this, you could see those arrows are not going in the same direction. So as this board tries to expand and contract, it's restricted by this board. And depending on the size of the board, you may or may not have problems. But the bigger the board, the more movement. And you have to allow for that movement. So uh, to sort of more directly answer the question if, if wood movement is necessary, let's look at a couple of boo-boos. A couple of uh, situations where folks maybe didn't make all the best decisions concerning wood movement or maybe underestimated it. And I'll start with me, because I have no problem making fun of myself. You guys may remember the rustic outdoor table that we built on the site a couple of months ago. Right, beautiful table, still in my backyard. Although the breadboards don't quite look as good as they did on day one. This is what the breadboards look like today. Each side has shrunk down by about a quarter inch. So that's a full half inch movement across that top. Now, uh, thinking back on it, I think the wood was probably just a little bit more uh, wet than I'm used to here in Arizona. So I got a lot of shrinkage. Do they know about shrinkage? Here's another example. Also, see, breadboard ends are a good example for this because that is a cross-grain situation. We'll get into that in a minute. But if you look very closely here, that's a green and green coffee table that's sitting in my living room. And if you look at that area where the ebony spline is, that spline is supposed to be proud of the, the breadboard. And it's sunken in, which tells you that that top, the center portion of that top, has shrunk down and sucked it in a little bit. Uh, and that's because I built this project in California, in Southern California, brought it home to Arizona, and naturally, it's uh, less humid here, so it shrunk. Now let's move into someone else's. Let's make fun of someone else today. Uh, Dan Reitler sent this to me. He says, this is a California redwood bar top that I installed at a customer's house last summer. This crack opened up after the long winter here in Michigan. <laughs> now this isn't something, it doesn't look to me like he violated any sort of rules of wood movement. But with wide boards, big, wide slabs like that, you do have movement issues. The wood is a natural product, and it just naturally moves with uh, changes in humidity and conditions. So sometimes cracks just open up. It's unfortunate, but that's how it goes. Now here's a really cool example. You're gonna love this. Look at this gorgeous table. Absolutely gorgeous. Nice circle design. He's got a metal plate in the center. This is from Matt Downer. Uh, he said, I'll tell you what's a downer, is what happens to this table, Matt. Uh, over time, expansion and contraction between these boards caused a big split. Uh, and what Matt realized he needed to do, as crazy as it may seem, he had to cut this into slices to rework it. Because the problem was it would continue to crack. Even if he repairs the crack, it wouldn't actually stop it from happening again. So by cutting it into slices, and then he added some reinforcement underneath. I mean, it's kind of a re-engineering of the whole thing, but it makes it work using some angle iron and other things, he basically reattached the slices, and now they have, think about a concrete um, situation where you have those expansion gaps between the pieces, and that's what was necessary to get this thing to survive the seasons. All right, so unfortunately, yeah, you do need to pay attention to wood movement. Now, the bigger the board, the more you have to consider. Also, this changes based on species, uh, the conditions that the piece is left in, as well as the time of year. Sometimes, uh, if you're building in the winter, you have different conditions than if you're building in the summer. So you have to keep that in mind. Now, a really handy tool that I recommend for you is the Woodshop Widget. Uh, that's an app, and also a, it's on the website. You could use it there, too, as a little flash uh, deal. Uh, very, very cool. There's a wood movement calculator. You select your wood, you select the type of cut that it is, and you can change either the moisture content or the relative humidity and show how it will change over the course of that change in humidity. So you might be wondering then, we showed some breadboard ends before, right? So how do breadboard ends work? Why is that okay? Here's a breadboard end top on a little jewelry box that we're gonna be making here on the show soon. And you can see, I violated that rule that I said before not to violate. Expansion of this panel will be across this way, and this piece isn't really gonna expand much this way. It might expand just a little bit, you know, in that direction, and there's nothing stopping it from doing that. So we have a problem where this breadboard end restricts the movement of this panel. So how do we get around it? Well, it all comes down to the construction method. Here's an example of a green and green breadboard, and in fact, this is the coffee table that I showed you before that now has a bit of a problem. 
If you look closely there, I'm only adding glue to the center, which you know makes sense. You glue it at the center, the panel can expand and contract at the end, you leave it so that the tongue and groove joint has a little bit of uh, room at the very end, but you're only securing it with glue in the middle, so everything can expand. But you still need to secure it at the ends, because otherwise it, you might actually see the ends of the breadboard pull away from the panel. So how do you do that? Well, in this case, you see those screws sitting on top of the panel? Those screws will go in oversized holes, so there won't be any glue at the ends, but we will have screws that will pull it nice and tight while still allowing some flexibility side to side. Uh, the thing is, you don't always want to use screws, right? There are times where screws just aren't appropriate. On green and green, you can cover those screws up with ebony plugs and it looks great, but you can't necessarily get away with that, especially you look at this example here, um, there's no room for screws here. So how do we make sure that it's nice and tight at the ends? Well, this brings up another thing that came up on Facebook recently. Uh, there's a video here, a little clip that I have from, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Doucette and Wolf. Uh, they posted this video showing a trick that they used with a sprung joint. That's the center right there where that little gap is. Tight at the ends. Now they're going to tighten the clamp in the middle. The gap in the middle is removed. And then it's now really tight at the ends. Right, so that methodology is doing, if you've never heard of it before, it's called a sprung joint, where you actually induce a little bit of a curvature in the board, so that when you clamp it in the center, the board has no choice. It's going to go nice and tight in the center, but by the time you pull it all the way in in the middle, you've really secured those outside edges. So essentially, it's kind of under tension. So if you just apply glue in the middle, squeeze it in with that one clamp, the outside should stay nice and tight. And that's actually, uh, that was what was done for this as well. It's on a smaller scale than that, but the concept still works very well. The other thing with sprung joints is they can be great for panel glue ups. So um, I'm gonna show you an example of a sprung joint. We'll actually cut one here. It's very easy to do. Um, as you're putting these two boards together, when you do wide panel glue ups, uh, one of the problems that people have uh, not only in applying the pressure properly, but having enough clamps to do it. So what's great about a sprung joint is most of the time you only really need one clamp right at the middle. So you bring that gap together and the outsides are already sort of applying pressure just based on the geometry of the joint. So I've already, this one has already been worked, has just a, a barely um, perceptible, perceivable, perceptible. Uh, let me know. It's got a little bit of a scoop, a little bit of a belly in it. So this one is now dead straight right off of the jointer. So let's put it into the leg vise. And the process for doing this, super easy. All you really need to do is get a smooth plane. You want something that's gonna be, uh, have a nice light touch. And what I'm really trying to do is remove some stock from the middle. Now my plane only takes a few thou at a time when it takes a shaving, very light, all right, this is Gossamer, as they say, gossamer stuff. So what I'm gonna do is remove material from the middle as best as I can. Sometimes you have to skew the plane to get the blade to work right. Right, and as soon as I remove pretty much as much as the plane is gonna let me remove right here, I can start going back a little bit, working out toward the ends. And this should be the last one. By doing that, what I've effectively done is created a little bit of a scoop. I haven't removed anything from the outside edges, just a little bit in the middle. Now, this is really tough to see, so you have to bear with me. Maybe take my word for it, but when we put these two together, you should see that there's just a little bit of a, a gap in the middle. Where's the, where's the middle? Oh. <laughs> see that? That's how good I am. She didn't even know it was two boards. Anyway, there's a microscopic gap. You might be able to put uh, a feeler gauge in there to find it. It doesn't have to be very much. But now if I just apply clamping pressure right in the center across this panel, that's all I need to close this joint up. Now, I also have a resource to recommend from, this was submitted by Mike Orsted. Orsted. Uh, it's a fine woodworking article by Gary Rogowski that's called Spring Joints, an Edge Glue Up's Best Friend. And it kind of goes over the whole logic and explains what we did and probably shows you a couple of other techniques. Let's start with a video from April Wilkerson. You guys might uh, have heard her. She's relatively, relatively new on YouTube, but has some really great videos showing some projects and techniques that she's into. Seems like a really nice person. 
and uh, talented as well. She is trying to spread the word about a program or an organization called Garden of Innocence. And it's very sad, I don't mean to bring the mood down here, but uh, it's a California-based organization and their goal is to uh, give a proper resting piece, a resting place to uh, children and infants who essentially have been abandoned um, and found deceased. So no one claims them and they feel like it's the right thing to do, you know, to give a proper burial. Um, and a lot of them are cremated. And this organization needs help with that because they need to have uh, the boxes made, uh, the urns. Woodworkers love to build things for people when it really matters, you know? It's, there's a lot of heart in the community. Uh, and this, this video clip will show you exactly what I'm talking about. So anytime that a child is abandoned and goes unclaimed, this organization will step in and claim the child. They will provide the child with a name and then proceed to give it a full service memorial. If there is any way that you could also lend your time and resources to help out, it would be going towards a very good cause. When all storm clouds rise, will they tell me of a home? When all storm clouds rise, oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. Beautiful stuff. Um, the plans, or the modified version, or April's version of the plans, are available on her website, and you can go to gardenofinnocence.com, and they have published plans there where you could build one of these things and send it to them. So it's a great cause. If you want to get involved, definitely do so. Really good stuff. And thank you, April, for bringing that to our attention. Bob Lang wrote an article recently called The Six Most Important Woodworkers I've Ever Known. Uh, this is about an experience he had over at the um, Andy Chidwick's school, and who is the guy's name, Matson, I guess? Uh, basically, they take underprivileged kids who are in a situation, as they say, you know, falling through the cracks, and try to give them a little bit of guidance, uh, let them experience making things with their hands um, in hopes of kind of refocusing their attention um, and putting them on the right path. So Andy has this fantastic program where these kids come to the school and they learn and build, and uh, Bob Lang was able to uh, be there to, I don't know exactly, I think he was assisting and sort of just being there to be, to be Bob Lang from Popular Woodworking, which would be nice in and of itself. Uh, but these kids built a, a bunch of chairs, absolutely beautiful chairs. Um, it's really inspiring, and here's a little quote from Bob. He says, when I look at the five students in the class, I see the future of woodworking and a solution to many of the problems our society faces. The headline of this post mentions the six most important woodworkers I know. Number six is the young man at the left in the picture. He graduated from the North Salem Woodworking Program two years ago. When he entered the program, he was thinking about dropping out of school. Instead, he graduated, now works full-time as a teaching assistant in the program, and is a full-time college student pursuing a degree in education. Doesn't get a whole lot better than that, does it? So um, if you want to read more about this or learn more about this, this is a yearly program that Andy does over there. Uh, go to chidwickschool.com. And uh, Andy's got a bunch of things. Check out his website. He's got a program there that you could sign up for as well. But really inspiring stuff. Fantastic. Uh, also, we've got a clip here from the Highland Woodworker, one of my favorite woodworking shows. If, uh, if you've been yearning for that sort of TV-style woodworking show, uh, this is where you're going to get it online is the Highland Woodworker. This one features uh, Glenn Huey, Megan Fitzpatrick, and uh, Jalen Wagoner. Um, if you're not familiar, he's sort of the young woodworking whiz kid uh, who's, uh, you find him actually published in a lot of places. He gets a lot of attention for his work, and it's well-deserved. Uh, he makes some great things, so there's a nice interview uh, with him. And let's take a look at this clip featuring Glenn Huey and showing how he makes that sprung joint using his jointer. Okay. Even on your dead flat jointer bed right now, you can see the fact that we're tight back here at the back, we're tight up at the front, but you can even see right now that it's raising up off of that bed just a little as bit. So when I bring these two over and I put them down side by side, you can see what's going on. I'm tight at the ends, but I've got that gap in the center. And now, so now do you have to put a whole bunch of clamps on it, the front no. and back? And <laughs> you would think so with a gap that big. But yeah. this is where the spring joint really, really pays dividends. I can go and put glue on both sides of this, put one clamp in the dead center, pull this into where I get a little squeeze out, and after that I'm going to be tight on these two ends where one clamp's all I need to glue up this piece. Up to about 24 inches I can get by with one single clamp. 
Think of the time it saves. Now, if you've been suffering through joiner setup woes, maybe this is a good solution. <laughs> Make it intentionally set improperly. I wish I could sit in it. I'm kind of tired. Uh, this is the bow arm Moorish chair, freshly assembled, has the first coat of finish on it. I just used a little bit of water locks uh, to kind of bring a little bit of uh, color and life to it. And then I'm going to finish it with some lacquer, Sherwin-Williams lacquer. Uh, with chairs, with all the, the different parts, it's so, I don't want to do it all by hand. So something like this, I really prefer to go to uh, a spray. But love this design. We've got a contoured back. You can see it actually can recline. And I've got pins here. These little turned pins, I made these on the lathe, right? And those go into holes and that support the backrest. And there's four holes, so we've got multiple reclining positions. And we'll have a seat in here that's gonna get upholstered. There's a nice little foot rest, uh, beautiful through tenons here on the top. And my only dilemma at this point is I don't know where the heck I'm gonna put this chair. Um, eventually you start building, like for the website, I build so many things that are not necessarily for me. I just build them because I want to or they've been requested um, that it becomes a little tricky to find out what to do with all this stuff. My mom pretty much wants everything that I make. So that's always a problem, but <laughs> it's a good problem to have, I guess, right? Uh, if you're interested in, the, in this particular project, you can go to thewoodwhisperguild.com to find out about that. Didn't realize you were this far along. Girlfriend, I've been busting my hump. Uh, this one I thought was really cool. I haven't read through the whole thing because it actually just came in yesterday. But it's Civil War Woodworking Volume 2 by A.J. Hamler. Uh, I know a lot of you are probably history buffs. I know when I'm cruising around the, the boob tube and I see some historical thing, it's hard for me to turn away. I enjoy it. And this is a bunch of projects that are uh, relevant to the time period. I guess like some of the, the folks who do the reenactment stuff, um, things that they use in, in their, uh, I don't know, what do you call that? when they play dress up. <laughs> What's that called? Uh, Civil War reenactment? I, I called it a reenactment, but <laughs> they play dress up. It's, what, no, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's cosplay for old dudes. Bob asks, what about when sealed? I have heard, don't worry about movement if you seal it in poly. Well, Bob, that's bad advice. Um, bottom line is finishes, film finishes, they will slow down the absorption and loss of moisture. Definitely will slow it down and it does help to stabilize your projects, but it is not impervious to moisture. You still will get some of that. So I would never trust the finish to control wood movement completely. Uh, that's a great way to find yourself with some cracked boards, right? So if you always just follow the rules of wood movement and then finish it, you're gonna have, for the most part, you're gonna stack the cards in your favor. Hey, there are times even if you follow all the rules as you know them and then finish it where you still may have problems. So let's stack the cards in our favor and make sure that at least, you know, we follow the rules. There's a good chance that nothing disastrous is going to happen. That's all I have to say about that. Nick Ferry wants to know, would you ever do a joint build with Nicole or a build off? Something simple, not requiring many tools. First of all, I will never build a project with Nicole. <laughs> She's dangerous. No, I'm not. I don't trust her in the shop. Uh, actually, this is something we, this is something, uh, we talked about this. Uh, she has a couple of projects she'd really like to make for our son, Mateo. And um, I thought it would be fun to have her come in and I can kind of guide her through the process, but she would do the bulk of the work. Um, so that is something if we can have time between guild builds, I'd love to do that. We've got a couple of projects in mind. We do collaborative builds and I wouldn't call it a build off. I don't really get too much in the competitive stuff in woodworking, it's not really my style. Uh, I like watching it, I just don't like doing it. Um, we are in all likelihood going to collaborate with Steve from Your Mortals again on this year's cancer charity for woodworkers fighting cancer. So we're kind of batting ideas back and forth right now, but expect that this fall. And if everything pans out, instead of just kind of like last year, it was last minute we brought Steve into the fold, we're sort of both gonna, you know, full force go into it and build uh, projects that have slight differences between them. And he's gonna go for a little bit more of a simplified basic design and mine will be, you know, it'll be in our styles, essentially. Uh, mine will be a little bit more complex with a little more complex joinery. And this way we can cover the, the wide variety of woodworkers out there and get the most money possible for this charity. So this year, I think is gonna be a killer event. So yeah, we do collaborations as well. It's so nice not to have problems with fleas, isn't it? Matthew S, great question. He says, hey Mark, how far can I get with a contractor's grade table saw? 
and what issues will I run into? I don't have the room or budget for a cabinet saw. Thanks. Matthew, you can get as far as you want with that saw. Don't be deceived into thinking that you absolutely need a cabinet saw to do really good woodworking. Um, I've known folks who use, uh, what is it? There's a whole form dedicated to the BT3 saw, and it's just a little rinky-dink saw that all these people just um, absolutely love because it was kind of one of those uh, diamond in the rough sort of products. Uh, and a lot of people rallied behind it and there are amazing projects coming off of a saw like that. The problems you're gonna run into is a lot of times you may have a saw that doesn't have the best fence on it, so it may not be a reliable fence that uh, sets down uh, dependably in the same position every time or may not line up perfectly the way you want it. That might be an issue. Your table may be a little bit small. Uh, that can certainly be remedied with an outfeed table. Well, and also the table saw fence is something you could always replace or uh, modify the one you have to try to make it work better. Uh, you can build outfeed and infeed support if you want to. I've seen people who take those little portable saws and build a whole table around it. So now support is no longer an issue. Uh, the third thing you probably confront is power. If it's not powerful enough, you're gonna have trouble with thicker hardwoods, but use the right blade and things suddenly become a lot easier. So if it's an underpowered saw, go with a thin kerf blade. If you're making rips, go with a thin kerf, but also go with a rip configuration for the teeth. Something that doesn't have a whole lot of teeth will cut through like butter, even if you only have a, uh, you know, one and a half horsepower. Um, so if you use the right materials, use good quality sharp blades, and add some things to the saw, you will never necessarily hit a wall with a contractor grade saw. It may not work as well. There may be things that my saw can do a little bit better or maybe a little bit more reliable, in, but it isn't a deal breaker, you know? So don't get it into your head that you need that cabinet saw. Colin Burris, I am just starting out. What would be better spending my money on, a table saw or a compound miter saw? Thanks, Mark. This may, this may be a different answer depending on who you ask, but for me, I would say a table saw. I find a table saw to be one of the most versatile tools, and although it's kind of been uh, made the enemy of the woodworking world just because it has a high potential for injury and uh, mistakes, um, it still is one of the most versatile tools we can have from cutting parts down and cutting down plywood, milling, and getting your joints set up. Think about all the different types of joints you could do at the table saw uh, just with a few add-ons. You could build sleds for it, cross-cut sleds, get a miter gauge and you know make a finger joint jig, you can get a tenoning jig. There's just so much that you can do with that table saw that for me personally, if I had to, to choose one or the other, I would go with the table saw first. This is Textfire, how you doing dude? It's been a while. Do you feel that woodworking as a craft is still in decline or are we in the middle of a resurgence? That's a really tough question and a good one because it's one of those things that I don't think we can really figure out. We can all debate it and we can, you know, yap our, our gums about this as much as we want, but the reality is it isn't until a few years go by and we look at things in retrospect that we'll truly understand what's happening. If you ask one group of people, not to point fingers, but let's say, you know, magazines, let's say old school publications, and you ask them how woodworking is doing, um, they're gonna, re like, think of it as a sinking ship. Um, they think that they're you know, maybe their readership is in decline. So to them, the audience is dying off. And I've heard that phrase said before, where, you know, woodworkers are dying faster than they're being replaced. Um, my opinion is that they're looking in the wrong places. Last week's episode, or last month's episode of, of TWW Live, we talked about makers, uh, makers versus woodworkers. And if you look in the maker community, um, there is so much going on there, and I think that ties in well to a lot of the DIY community as well. There are so many people getting into it. Now, it may not be what we traditionally think of as a woodworker. Um, you know, the, the old bearded guy in his shop, you know, whittling away at something. Um, these are people with new ideas, new concepts, new ways to get things done, and really, more importantly, new ways to communicate what they're doing. So I think that the craft of creating things, be it in wood, plastic, metal, Yarn, God forbid. <laughs> no matter what the medium is, I think there is a creative vein, you know, in, in our world, of, uh, on, especially the online world, that is alive and well. So if you ask me, I don't think anything is in decline. I think it's changing. There's a big change going on right now. Now, where we end up after this, will some of these makers get into the finer parts of wood craftsmanship? Uh, to me, the bottom line is the more people who are interested in making things with their hands, the bigger the pool of people that we can then 
inspire to go into specialized areas. So we have to have this stuff out there to get people interested. So maybe someone got into this because they wanted to build a robot and then they learned how to cut plywood as a part of the process. And then that person's mom says, oh hey, you know how to use a table saw, can you do some flooring for me? And then it, it sort of snowballs until the person is building furniture. So you don't know where these people are gonna get that inspiration, where it's gonna come from. And they may not immediately start out going, I wanna be a furniture maker, but they may end up there. Right? So for me, from my perspective, I think the outlook is good. When I look at my uh, stats on our website, when I look at things going on on other people's YouTube channels, as well as my own, um, I can't help but see a bright future for, for making things, uh, and that includes wood. Mark Nyland, he says, why can't I keep my shop as clean as yours? Because you don't have an Arlie. Arlie is my stepfather, and uh, about once a week he comes into the shop and does a nice little thorough cleaning. He gets paid for his work, so I'm not that cheap. Uh, but he does come behind, and you should have seen, this floor was coated with sawdust and shavings yesterday. But he came in, did a nice little cleaning, and it's done. And that's very helpful. And since I have a lot of electronics in here, I'm in here every day, I like my shop space to be clean because that's the kind of environment that inspires me to do good work. Last one from JMK89, he says, do you use in-feed, out-feed support for the bandsaw? Any ideas, it might be the best way to approach this. I do use some support, but it's roller stands. I know folks who have built permanent supports or ones that can kind of roll out of the way, that's great. I just haven't had the time or, or really the inclination to do that. Roller stands, when I need that sort of outfeed or infeed support, uh, a roller stand on each side does a fine job for me. So the next one is gonna be Friday, August 1st, 1 p.m. Eastern. Same time, same channel. Um, also, contact info, you can find us at thewoodwhisperer.com. Of course, our YouTube channel. What is the YouTube channel? <laughs> it's youtube.com slash user slash thewoodwhisperer. You, you don't have to put the user in. Really? Yeah, you can just do the wood whisperer. That's news to me, Nicole. I know. Thanks for the heads up Pretty on sure. that. I've done it before. You're awesome. <laughs> uh, you can also send us a question to the hashtag TWWLive and catch us on Facebook, facebook.com slash thewoodwhisperer. All right, and I think that wraps it up. Thanks for watching again, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Bye. Thanks for participating. Yeah, for thanks for participating. <laughs> She's good. I know, right? Tongue tied. I know about the hair. I don't want to hear it. I need a haircut. <laughs> uh, going off screen. These moves. <laughs>